50% of your body's ability to do this in the head and the neck occurs at the occiput, the back of the skull, and the first vertebra in your neck. This is Dr. Perry from Stop Chasing Pain, and I wanted to take an opportunity to record a video to go over a concept theory, the joint by joint, that has been so influential for me for about the past, oh, geez, I think it's going on like 10 years or more, of looking at the movement of the body, trying to put the puzzle pieces together of why people have pain in different areas of the body that might not be going away when you're just focusing on those areas where the pain is. Hence the name, Stop Chasing Pain. And this is by uh, two friends of mine, Greg Cook and Mike Boyle. Make sure you check them out. They have a lot of really wonderful work. And I want to go over the fundamental concepts here, working from the bottom up. And uh, have you check out a couple of things, maybe on your own. Maybe you'll solve a puzzle piece for yourself or someone in your life. I'm not guaranteeing that, but I'm going to give you some options because you have to remember every individual is an individual. What might work well for you can make another person worse. That's all based on history and how somebody moves. But I'd like to go over these fundamental concepts. It's just a good way to begin a framework, All right? Let's talk about mobility and stability. You you see those listed here around different parts of the body with different colors. I'll, I'll go over those in a moment. So let's, let's go over what those terms mean, at least for me. Mobility is the ability to actually move. You need to have the requisite motion to actually move. Okay. But when you move, you need to have control of that movement. You need to have stability. So stability or stability is the ability to resist movement. Like you have, for instance, a stable base. The more stability you have up to a certain point, you're able to generate a lot more power and force. So Paul Check, a uh, brilliant uh, trainer, kind of the pioneer of functional training, always says that uh, stability always precedes, comes before force production, right? I've said this on a prior video, is that an analogy that he gives is like, imagine trying to shoot a cannon out of a canoe as opposed to a cannon on land. Because on land, you've got stability, and then the cannon can generate the power. You can send the ball a long way. But what if it's sitting in the canoe? There's no stability to it. And then if you fire the cannon, first of all, the boat's going to go over, the canoe's going to go over. But second of all, you're not going to get as much trajectory on that cannonball because you had no stable base, right? The important thing to remember here is that all the joints of your body need both. You need to have mobility and stability. How much you need of each one changes based on the task that you're asking it to accomplish and the environment that you're in. So what I mean by that is at one moment, your ankle may need a lot of mobility, but in the next moment in time, it's got to be more stable and you need to be able to kind of go in and out of that as needed, as balanced. And then that's called motor control, right? And that's a nervous system thing. Now, what can happen through prior injuries, history, trauma, posture, all these sorts of repetitive micro movements, these things can get stuck to be more of one way than the other overall which means you can have stuck joints that are less mobile and other ones you can have sloppy, loosey-goosey ones that are not stable. In particular, if you've had some sprains to uh, different ligaments, for instance, or you have a condition where you may have hypermobility. But let's go over the fundamental ones uh, and tell you where you are most likely will feel some symptoms when there's an issue with it, all right? Let's start down in the ankle joint. Now, the ankle should be mobile and stable, right? But overall, it needs more mobility. 
That's called ankle dorsiflexion. That's bending your toes up towards your face. And plantar flexion, flexion is moving your toes away from you. Now, you need a lot of that ankle mobility to be able to, one, walk, but definitely squat down. And you need a lot of it, uh, for instance, in the all sports, but basketball players need it a ton where they're going to come down a little bit and then launch up with a shot. You need to have good mobility, right? Now, what can happen is, is that if you lose ankle mobility, that's a loss of range of motion. That range of motion has to go somewhere. That's energy. Okay, energy gets transferred, doesn't disappear. It's got to go somewhere. So what it's going to do is it's usually going to go above and below. So it's going to send that increased motion to your knee. Now, if you look at your knee, your knee, yeah, it's got to be mobile, but it needs to be more stable than anything because you don't want a sloppy knee that's twisting on itself or going in and out called varus and valgus. You don't want a lot of that because then you're going to get some ACL injuries. You're going to get some meniscus injuries and all sorts of stuff like that, right? So then what happens is that now the knee has to have more mobility. It's less stable overall because it has to take the energy from the loss of mobility in the ankle. You follow, right? Now, imagine that step after step, day after day, week after week, month after month, then it may lead to something where you'll have a little micro trauma builds up in there. And then all of a sudden the knee starts to hurt you today when it didn't hurt you yesterday. Right? So the loss of mobility in one area will shoot to another area that's supposed to be stable and you'll get too much movement. That's why I tell people one of the first things you want to look at when anybody has knee injuries or knee issues, or any anything in the body, honestly, is do they have enough ankle mobility? Check ankle mobility. You could check some YouTube videos on how to check that. I do that on my website as well. And then look for alternatives to increase ankle mobility. This is the awareness that you need to have ankle mobility. All right. Make sure you check both sides. Now, the bottom of the foot, which is not labeled here, should be stable. Now, that makes sense, right? You want a stable but mobile bottom foot. Many people don't have a stable bottom foot. They have flat feet, right? And so the loss of stability in the bottom of the foot or wearing improper shoes like that, they don't have uh, good arch supports then you lose stability in the bottom of the foot. And that's the person who may get plantar fasciitis. One, because you have a problem with ankle mobility here. That's why bottom of the footwork is important. Now, the big toe. The big toe should be more mobile. You need to be able to extend, bend backwards that big toe pretty far, like 65 degrees backwards. So if you grab your big toe and you bend it backwards, it should be able to reach 65 degrees. If you lose the mobility in that big toe, well, then it's gonna, you're going to pay the price in the bottom of the foot. You're going to pay the price in the, in the knee. You'll pay the price all the way up the chain. So not just the ankle but you need to have good big toe mobility, right? So look into increasing big toe extension and you may feel improvement all the way up the chain. Now let's look at the hip joint. The hip joint, that's the powerhouse generator, right? Your hips should lead your power movements. All great athletes will tell you it comes from the hips, being able to twist and torque the hips. So if you move the torso and the hips, you need to be able to make sure the hips can rotate in and rotate out, that they can flex forward and they can extend backwards. So the hip joint needs to have good mobility. Very often people have locked down hip joints because of one, too much sitting, not enough walking, poor control in the glute muscles or glutes atrophy, just not using their rear end enough. And then the hips get locked down. So if the hips get locked down, 
once again, you can send stuff to the knee. So the knee pays the price from the hip and the ankle. The knees take a beating. So anytime you have knee issues, make sure that you're checking or your therapist or who you're seeing is looking at your ankles and your hips and you're asking about prior injuries or traumas, pardon me, anything like that. And make sure you check both sides. Now, the, the lumbar spine slash pelvis should be stable, right? Now, what happens a lot is that people lose mobility in the hips, particularly on rotating the hips internally, but it can go externally. It can go both ways. Then you'll take too much motion in the lower back here. So it's no longer stable and you'll get too much motion. And that's the person who ends up with lower back pain, maybe some disc herniations and things like that. All right. And when you lose the hips, you'll usually pay the price in the lumbar spine, but look above as well. Look at the, the thoracic spine, the thorax and the rib cage. That's a huge one. Everybody, you're supposed to get a ton of motion in the thoracic spine, more rotation should occur there and than, than any part of your spine. And you need to have good rib cage mobility. Those are usually out to lunch on most people because of no walking, no rotation, poor breathing patterns, poor posture. And if you lose mobility in the thoracic spine, then look what sits down below. You're going to pay the price down in the lower back. So in my world, lower back rehab programs should involve an assessment to see the, the range of motion in the rib cage, the thoracic spine, and down below at the hip joint, okay? But now you know better, you're going to extend it all the way down to the ankle and the big toe because those make a difference in what? How your foot hits the ground, how it absorbs force, how you can propel off your big toe and move your hip backwards and use your glute through what's called a gait cycle, right? And we know that a, at least Stuart McGill, the preeminent um, biomechanist on lower back pain will tell you that when you have a slower walking stride, you're more prone to the lower back pain. One reason is because you have more contact time down on the ground with your foot hitting the ground as opposed to a faster pace walking. He calls walking nature's back balm, helping the lower back. That's moving. Now, let's look up at the uh, cervical spine. I'm going to give two parts to this. You only see the first part. You have your uh, lower cervicals and you have your upper cervicals. You typically have, most humans, seven bones in your neck. Cervical one, cervical two, that's atlas and axis. And then you have the occiput, which is the back of the skull. And then you have number three, four, five, six, seven. Your lower thoracic spine, your lower cervical spine, excuse me, should have more stability to it. Your upper cervical spine, okay, that should have, I'm gonna make this a little bit bigger. <clears throat> Here we go, All right? So I'll make this a little bit bigger. Your upper cervical, your occiput, C1, C2, that should have most of the motion in your cervical spine. And when you bend your head forward and you bend your head backward, that's called flexion and extension, okay? 50% of your body's ability to do this in the head and the neck occurs at the occiput, the back of the skull, and the first vertebrae in your neck. 50% of this whole motion happens in those top two. The rest of the 50% is from everything below it, okay? Two through seven. So that's big. Now, let's think about rotation. Rotating to the left and rotating to the right. Most of that should happen at cervical one, cervical two, atlas and axis. Okay, that's number one and number two. 50% of your turning happens at those two joints. The rest of the 50% occurs from everything that's remaining. So what does that mean? 
The top three bones are absolutely critical for mobility because if you lose the mobility in the top three, where do you have more mobility outside of that? You have it in the lower cervicals and they're not supposed to do that. So they're wear and tear. Now, how does posture make a difference? Well, look at me. If, if my head is far forward like this, and if I breathe through my mouth, which many people often do, as opposed to the nose, I crunch down on those top three. So I lose the mobility here, and then this lower cervical spine is locked out there. So it's automatically less stable from being out here, and it's going to be less stable because I lose mobility here. That's one of the reasons why you can get some uh, manipulations, adjustments, mobilizations from healthcare professional, like a physio, osteo, chiro, to where they can mobilize the neck, or you can get uh, some massages done up here, or you can get some decompression, a little distraction at the top, to open those first three up, and it makes people feel better down below here, right? So here's the, here's the takeaway from the first exposure to the joint by joint, because I'm concentrating mostly right now on the mobility uh, issue, is this, okay? Just note from here, if you increase or restore mobility in these joints, big toe, ankle, hip, thoracic spine, upper cervical, okay? Through working with fascia, working with the muscles, working with the joints as well, you will likely notice a positive result in feeling better in the stability issues, the knee, the lower back, and the neck, okay? Now, once you do increase mobility, then you want to work on stability, right? So that's one of the things that's that's happens here. So if you get more motion in areas that haven't had a lot of motion, you need to teach the nervous system and the brain what to do with that new motion because it's it's going to be available to it now, but it doesn't quite know what to do with it. So in that case, a couple of things can happen. One, you might get hurt because you don't have good control. Two, if you don't teach it to how to control the new motion, you'll usually fall back into the old pattern and lose the mobility again because you didn't teach the brain and the nervous system anything new to do with it. So it'll just run back to what it knows. It'll run back to what? Older compensation, adaptation, uh, functional patterning that it needed to do in order to keep you surviving. So you're surviving, but you're probably not thriving in your most optimal movement pattern. So that's why one of the things that I like to do the most is uh, I'll, I'll reference the video at the end here is that um, if you get the mobility in these areas, I like to do ground-based body weight type movements. One of my favorites are rolling patterns and moving on the ground. And I also learned that from my friend, Greg Cook and Lee Burton from FMS, the Functional Movement Systems. If you go in, uh, I'll, I'll link the video in my description below. You, I've recorded some videos of quite a few years ago on doing rolling patterns. There's easier versions and there's harder versions called a hard roll. And I encourage you to explore other different videos from other people and look up rolling patterns on uh, Google. You'll see me show up because I've written several articles for healthcare publications about rolling patterns and how it helps what they call core stabilization. What's the key word there? Stabilization. And they're way more challenging than they look, but they're highly effective to do as a nice way to begin to incorporate some neurological, full body, brain, nervous system patterning of everything together down on the ground in what they call a low threshold, low load environment 
typically easier for your brain and your nervous system to incorporate those patterns in there uh, as opposed to just standing up and going hashtag beast mode monster too quick, too fast, too soon on uh, things where you have to fight gravity. Okay. So if you're not able to do things down on the ground, you should be able to then just, you know, try to do some of these rolling patterns on an elevated surface that you can maybe a bed that's a little bit um, um, more stable. Okay. Or get somebody to assist you and help you to get down on the ground and try to practice these things. Plus going down to the ground and getting back up again is a good way to help build your overall full body resilient strength. Okay. So I hope you enjoyed that. And it gave you some different perspectives on looking at how the body moves you through mobility and stability and motor control, integrating those all in together. Go after some of the stuck joints, increase stability in the ones that need stability, then also work on stability on the areas that you gave more mobility to. And I would uh, start uh, and just do one at a time, which means that I, I don't want you to just go in there and just do an ankle session, do a hip session, do a thoracic spine session, do a neck session all at once, because it's probably going to be way too much of a change for your nervous system. You'd be taking away compensations and adaptations that have been put there for a reason over a long period of time. And if you overwhelm the nervous system like that, your results will usually not be as good. So I would pick one at a time and work my way up and see what changes. You're probably going to get your biggest bang for your buck in uh, your ankle. And, um, you know, another piece is probably uh, hips are pretty good, but that thoracic spine's a game changer and the rib cage really is. But um, I digress. Just pick one at a time, see what changes, and then you can add another one to the mix. So, for instance, ankles one time, then see how you do. Then you can do ankles and you can check hips and then you can work your way up to the top. But as I said before, if you want to start from the top and work your way down, have at it. Okay. It depends on the individual. The biggest thing and the most important thing from this video is the awareness of looking at mobility, looking at stability, trying to do a few things to change those.